<clears throat> Hopefully, these questions will help everyone. The most important question first. How can a 13-year-old know God? Jesus said from the least to the greatest, so that's why we begin there. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you probably, whoever wrote that question, <clears throat> you probably read that when Jesus was 12 years old, he was in the temple and he told his earthly mother and Joseph, his earthly father, I must be about my father's business. And he knew the scriptures so well by the age of 12 that he could even answer and ask questions from the scholars of his day. Now, the most amazing thing about that is Nobody had a Bible like this in those days. And Jesus never had a Bible at home. So how did he know the scriptures? He didn't come from heaven like a, with the knowledge in his head. He was born just like any other baby. And the only way the Jewish people could know scripture was they had these scrolls in the synagogue. And that was the place where the scripture was read every Saturday. And probably in the Jewish schools, they quoted from scripture. So, Jesus would have been just paying attention very carefully. He never had a written Bible with him. But paying attention regularly, let's say from the age of three. Listening, 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 listening. Carefully paying attention. And by the time he was 12 years old, he really knew the scriptures. When he realized that he had emptied himself of his, not his deity, he was still God on earth, but he emptied himself of the privileges of God, and he grew up just like any other child. So that's a great example for all young children to be serious about the things of God even when you're very young. And it's not just um, Jesus. Samuel was a very young boy when he could hear God speaking to him. And um, how old was he? Maybe three, four years old or five. And he was listening to God. We read in the Old Testament also of Joseph who was 17 years old. Genesis 37 and he was having dreams which were prophetic. That means dreams from God. What does the average 17 year old boy nowadays dream about? And what did Joseph dream about? It, it depends on what they, you know, we dream about what we set our mind on during the day. And um, obviously Joseph must have set his mind on the things of God for him to dream about spiritual things. So there are examples like that of people who sought God. So I would say for a young 13 year old, one of the most important things that you've got to be careful about is company. The type of company you keep in school or friends, they are the ones who can drag you down if you're not careful. Um, people say, should I give up all my worldly friends? Teenagers ask that question. I say, well, that depends on, um, it's like a tug of war. I don't know whether you have that here where people pull a rope and pull on both sides. You have that here? Well, we do that often in India. And uh, I say, you're holding on to this end of the rope and all your worldly friends are on the other side. And if you find that you are able to pull them towards God's kingdom by your influence, hang on to the rope. Keep that friendship. But if you find that the rope is moving the other way and you're, they're pulling you that way, then drop the rope. So that's the advice I give. Uh, it's not standard for everyone. It depends on each individual's ability, spiritual ability, and depends on how worldly the other people are. And it's possible if you um, really study the scriptures, even at that age, read it, God can speak to you. And the little things, 
that you know if you obey. And of course, on top of it all, I would say, honor your father and mother. Uh, listen to them, obey them, obey them when it's convenient, and obey them when it's inconvenient. And then I believe God will honor you. So that's what I would say to all children and teenagers. And you can grow up to be one who knows God. Okay. Uh, how can we correlate, I think what he means is the prayer of Jabez to expand his boundaries with to be satisfied with our God-given boundaries. Now the prayer of Jabez is a very popular book. It's very popular with all those who love money. And uh, you know somebody else wrote a book called The Prayer of Jesus <laughs> which is a better prayer than the prayer of Jabez. The prayer of Jesus is the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven Jesus said, don't pray like Jabez, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins and as we forgive others and deliver us, lead us not in temptation, deliver us. Not one word about money or any such thing. One of the main things that we need to understand is that in the Old Testament, which ended with the day of Pentecost. The blessing under the Old Covenant, it started on Mount Sinai, ended on the day of Pentecost. The blessing of God was manifested in financial prosperity, earthly possession of a land in Canaan, physical healing, many children, that's the part most people don't want, but all the other things they look for, <laughs> prosperity, land, healing, etc. But it's all part of Old Testament blessing. You can read it in Deuteronomy 28. And so that is the type of blessing they sought for. If you obeyed God, God would bless you with prosperity, healing, etc. And um, so I suppose that was right for Jabez to pray like that. But after the New Covenant, we pray like Jesus, not like Jabez. And there we learn to submit to whatever God has appointed for us. Okay, the next question, since God is our Father and everything is purposed, it's not very clear. Are we ever to wrestle with God as Jacob did? Or pray to him to change his plans like Abraham did? I'm not sure where exactly Abraham prayed to change his plans. See, and maybe he's referring to Moses praying that God would not destroy Israel. However, <clears throat> see, prayer, in, again, when we go to the Old Testament like Jacob and Moses, we can learn certain lessons. But ultimately, our example is not Jacob or Moses or Jabez or David or even Elijah or even John the Baptist. Our example is Jesus Christ. That's just one thing that I want to uh, affirm and I want all of you to recognize. If you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. Is the great chapter on faith. And... It's about Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and so many others. But whenever you read Hebrews chapter 11, always bear in mind the last verse. The last verse is, God has provided something better for us than for all these people. And that better thing is what's listed in the next four verses. We look at Jesus, who's, who is the author of our faith. Verse 2 of Hebrews 12. So the author of my faith is not Enoch, 
not Abraham, not David, not Joshua, not the faith to tear lions in pieces like Samson or to pull down the walls of Jericho like Joshua or split the Red Sea. Jesus did, never did any of those things. But the faith to, verse 2, take up the cross, despise the shame and ridicule of the world, follow in the footsteps of God's will, and end at the throne of God. So it's very different from the Old Testament. We don't look for those earthly things. So when we look at Jesus' life, he wasn't wrestling with God to try and change God's will. He prayed in Gethsemane, but his prayer was, Father, I want to do your will, not mine. All through his life, he was listening to more to what does my father want me to do. And the wrestling that Jacob went through is a picture of God having to break the stubbornness of Jacob. That's the picture there. And our stubbornness, God has to break. God took Moses into the wilderness to shatter his pride that he was such a capable Egyptian trained leader. And when he became helpless and weak, then God said, now I'm, you're fit to be used by me. And <clears throat> in intercession, in prayer, God gives us the privilege of praying with him, not to change his will, but more to cooperate with him in, you know, he wants to, us to have the joy of having had a share in his work. And to me, uh, God can do a lot of things without us. He can do everything without us, but he gives us the privilege of joining with him. It's like if a father is taking, a, say, a coffee table from one room to the other, and his three-year-old son says, Dad, I want to help you. And his dad says, okay, just hold a corner of that table. And the three-year-old holds the corner of the table, and they move it to another room. And he gets the satisfaction. He goes and tells mommy, you know, dad and I moved the coffee table to the other room. So all he did was hold the corner of that table and really that's what we do in prayer. God gives us the privilege of joining with him um, to fulfill his will on earth so that we have a, a sense of satisfaction that we've also done something. I mean, that's not a complete picture, but it's a small picture. You know, for example, think of the story of that little boy with five loaves and two fishes. Jesus could have produced bread from nothing. <laughs> he didn't have to get five loaves to start with. But he gave that boy an opportunity to say, I cooperated with Jesus in this ministry. And we must recognize that that is the privilege God gives us. For us to do God's work is as crazy as trying to feed 5,000 people with five loaves. But if we give our five loaves to Jesus, it's amazing what he can do. So that's the purpose of intercessory prayer. What should I do if I want to forgive someone but I can't? See, that can be a real problem for some people who have suffered very serious harm at the hands of others. Most of us, people have hurt us very little. Uh, and sometimes even small things like that, we find difficult to forgive. But think if somebody raped your only daughter and murdered her. I think you may find it pretty difficult to forgive such a person. I think I would. What would I do in such a case? And I see him, that guy ruined my little girl's life. I would have to, but I still know that God tells me to forgive. I'd have to go to God and say, Lord, I want to obey your command, but I don't have the strength to do it. Give me the ability. I want to obey your command because I know that's the best for me. But, uh, I need help from above and God will help us and bring something good out of it. Maybe he'll convert that person and bring him to Christ. 
so that something good comes out of my forgiveness. So I, I've often thought of the picture of, uh, no, the story of Peter cutting off the Roman soldier's ear in Gethsemane and Jesus picking up that ear from the ground and fixing it back to that person's face. I'm almost certain that I'll meet that Roman soldier in heaven because I cannot imagine man experiencing something like that from the hand of someone he had come to capture and not getting converted. And uh, Peter and he must be having a wonderful time in heaven right now saying, <laughs> and he must be telling Peter, hey, thank you for cutting off my ear. <laughs> <laughs> because of that I got converted. You know, God's got amazing ways of using evil and turning it into good. So, if we forgive somebody, that's, we can find, even if it's something terribly evil that person did, and you ask God for grace to forgive that person, just like Jesus forgave those who hurt him, we can believe that something good will come out of it. That's for sure. And you can miss that out by having a bitterness which gives you nothing but ulcers and headaches and sleepless nights. It's far better to forgive. But we need to ask God for grace for that. There's no doubt about it. Okay, I know I have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I've asked God, but nothing happened. Why? Is it a lack of faith or should I keep waiting? I think it's a question of what we're expecting. See, we may have heard so many testimonies of people who spoke in tongues or got an electric shock in their body or some type of physical manifestation when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. So unconsciously what you're looking for is not the baptism of the Holy Spirit anymore. You're looking for this manifestation. So I would say to you, don't look for the manifestation. Look for the reality of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, the same way that God gave you an assurance that your sins were forgiven. How did he assure you that your sins are forgiven? Through the double witness of what is written in God's word, assuring you that Christ died for your sins, and if you confess your sins, he forgives you. And the second is the witness of the Holy Spirit. It's this double witness that assured you your sins are forgiven. The Spirit bore witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. See, throughout Scripture, it's this double witness and the double operation of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Even in Genesis chapter 1, it says when the world was in a corrupt state, um, the Holy Spirit moved, it says in the second verse in Genesis, and the Word of God went forth. God said, God said. So Genesis chapter 1 teaches us that the earth was changed by the dual operation of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And that's how God changes us too, by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. So that's how you got an assurance that your sins are forgiven. It wasn't just a scripture. That scripture, you got a witness in your heart from the Holy Spirit. Yes, you've been forgiven. Now exactly the same way. Ask the Lord to give you a witness in your heart that God's filled you with the Holy Spirit. And when you have that witness, you can thank the Lord, but don't wait for a manifestation. There may be manifestations. That's, leave it to God. The manifestations are different. Not everybody speaks in tongues. That's very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's one of the gifts. And even Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, I w uh, 14 rather, I wish you all spoke in tongues, which means that not everybody did. Um, it's a good gift, but it's not if it were necessary, God would give it to everyone. But the mark of the spirit-filled life is power to be a witness for Christ. That's what Jesus said in Acts 1.8. So that's what we should look for, power to be, not just to bear witness with our words, but to be a witness means by our life and our words. And leave it to God what gifts to give you. And uh, don't come to him with the only two requirements I see are what Jesus said in John 7 verse 37, 38. You thirst, if anyone thirst, let him come to me. And secondly, he who believes. 
So it's thirst and faith. So if you have a great thirst, not to speak in tongues, but to have power to be a witness for Christ, that is what you should have. And I'm not saying we should be against any of these gifts. If God wants to give you tongues, be willing to accept it. But that's not the main thing. The main thing is the power to be a witness for Christ. And if you have a thirst for that and say, Lord, I really long to be an effective witness for Christ by my life and by my words. And you hunger and thirst and pray to God and uh, trust that he will answer it. I believe God will immerse you. The word baptis, baptism is a Greek word which means immerse. Baptized in the Holy Spirit has got a sort of a religious feel about it that confuses people. But the plain translation of it would be immersed in the Holy Spirit. Just like we are immersed in water, which we call baptism in water. We are immersed in the Holy Spirit. And basically it just means being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the first time people were filled with the Holy Spirit was called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And they need to be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. I also want to clarify one thing that it says in Romans 8 verse 9 because a lot of people are confused by this. I just want to clarify it. In Romans in chapter 8 and verse 9 it says that if anyone, the last part of that, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he doesn't even belong to him. Do you belong to Christ? If you're sure that you belong to Christ because you're born again, then whether you realize it or not, the Spirit of Christ has come to dwell in you. The Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit. But you may not be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is a very controversial doctrine in Christendom. But as I've studied it in Scripture, I believe that a person receives the Spirit when he's really born again. But he may not be filled with the Spirit. That depends on how much of his life he yields to God. And I pictured it like this. If your heart is like a heart with ten rooms, and they're all dark, it's the unconverted state, and you've got one room where you desperately want light, and that's the room called the room of guilt because of your past life so we say Lord please come in and get rid of my guilt so Christ comes in and when you say Christ comes in when you say Lord Jesus come into my life or my heart and be Lord of my life who is it who comes in the Father is in heaven Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father the one person of the Trinity who is on earth since the day of Pentecost is the Holy Spirit. Just like the second person of the Trinity was on earth in Israel for 33 and a half years. It's the third person, well, he went up, the second person of the Trinity. The third person of the Trinity came on the day of Pentecost and has been here ever since. All over the world. So when we ask Christ to come in, it's really the Spirit of God who's coming in. The Spirit of Christ comes in. That's why it says if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, then you don't even belong to Him. But you've asked Him to come into one area to remove your guilt. But there are a lot of other areas. To be filled means the whole heart is filled with the Spirit of God. That means you have allowed Him to enter every area of your life. You remember what Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. And He doesn't force His way in anywhere. Supposing the Lord knocks at the, another door in your heart. You've already received him into one room, the guilt room, and he's removed your guilt. So Christ dwells in you. You're born again. The Spirit of Christ has come in. But now he knocks at another door in your heart and saying, uh, can I come into your television room? And you say, well, Lord, I'm not so sure whether I want you there because I watch a few programs which... You may not be very happy with that. Ah, the Lord says, that's fine. I won't come there. That room remains locked. Uh, can I come into your library and see what all books you read? Uh, say, Lord, 
I don't want you there either. Can I, and the Lord says, can I have a look at your, the DVDs and the type of music you listen to? And you say, no, Lord, I don't want you to come there either. So the, he will not, he's a gentleman. He never walks into a room which you don't open. So imagine somebody knocking at your door and you say, come in, come in, come in, and you keep the door locked from the inside. <laughs> this is exactly why many people are not filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's as eager to come inside as sunlight is eager to come into your room. But if you pull the blinds and pull the curtains and block off every little avenue from which light can come in, the sunlight's not going to come in. But as soon as you open a little slit, the sun comes in. That is how eager the Holy Spirit is to come into your life. And what does faith mean? Through 54 uh, years of knowing the Lord, I have come to my own definition of faith, which is based on scripture, but which uh, I don't have a verse for. The closest verse I can find is, if you being evil know how to give good things to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things in the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So my definition of faith is, faith is to believe that God is more eager to give me what he has promised than I am eager to receive it. God is more eager to give me what he has promised than I am eager to receive it. Not everything I ask for, what he has promised. And he's definitely promised forgiveness of sins, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Many th good things like this in the New Testament, holiness of life. To believe that my heavenly father is more eager to give me that than I am eager. And if you believe that you are more eager, God's not so eager, then you're, that's unbelief. And that's how a lot of people come to God. They think you've got to twist God's arm and somehow convince him that you deserve the Holy Spirit. It's a lot of rubbish. God is more eager to give you the Holy Spirit than you are. And if there is a hindrance, it's because there's some locked doors in your heart which you haven't opened. Just try opening it and see how your prayer is answered quickly. Okay. I want to live, live for God, but I'm afraid in front of some people, most of all my family members, to speak the truth. I want to be delivered from that. Well, then you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, definitely. I prayed and cried. Nothing has happened. Uh, it makes me very sad. I think you should not just wait patiently, pray, and see if every area of your life, to the best of your knowledge, is open and surrendered to God, and then believe. Lord, I believe you are more eager to fill me with the Holy Spirit than I am to be filled. And to the best of my knowledge, I have opened every area of my life to you. I open my life, come and fill every area of my life with your Holy Spirit. I believe you and I guarantee God will give you an assurance that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And in a period of time, you will see rivers of living water flowing out of your life. Okay, I know that God looks at the heart and the motive when he's judging our works, pleasing to him. Why then was Uzzah struck for touching the ark? Why does the Bible say God's anger burned against Uzzah? See, uh, there is a saying in, a uh, question in English. Does the end justify the means? Some people say the end justifies the means. That means... If your ultimate aim is good, uh, it doesn't matter how you get there. But in, as a Christian, the means must also be spiritual, not just the end. That means my goal must be spiritual, and the way I get to that goal must also be spiritual. You know, for example, to bring people to Christ is spiritual. But to try and bring them to Christ by giving them money or some other means, that's not right. Um, so that's an example, a crude example of, so in the same way, we need to ask ourselves, why did God strike Uzzah dead? Because there was a clear teaching in the Old Testament that, that was 
they were instructing the Lord, nobody must touch the ark. Except God was trying to teach them reverence for him. And um, sometimes he had to punish people severely in order to teach people that reverence. And remember those were days when people didn't have the Holy Spirit. The time had not yet come for the Spirit of God to come. So there are a lot of things in the Old Testament which we can't fully understand today. But we do know that in the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira, after the coming of the Holy Spirit, was struck dead for just pretending, pretending that they were giving all their money when they were not giving all their money. And Peter said, listen, God never wanted your money. <laughs> Before you sold your house, it was yours. After you sold your house, the money was still yours. God never wanted it. And there's nothing wrong in giving God 1% or 10% or 50%. But why do you have to pretend? And they were punished for pretense. Because hypocrisy is considered a very serious sin. And God sometimes has to do something drastic to teach people um, that sin is a serious thing. Okay, this is a personal question. What is Brother Zach's tent-making business? <laughs> Uh, there is a verse in the Bible which says, don't be a busybody in other people's matters. <laughs> but however, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I believe it's a sincere question. Because some people don't know what tent making means. So I'll explain what that means. Tent making is an expression that's become common in Christendom it only means that here is a full-time Christian worker who is not employed in a secular job, but who is serving the Lord full-time, but he is not being supported by other people paying his salary in a church, or he's not living off, I mean, he may receive gifts like Paul did, but he's not dependent on the gifts of others to live and to take care of his and his family needs. So Paul, now not everybody was like this. Jesus, for example, was dependent on people giving him money for the last three and a half years of his ministry. He was not a tent maker. And Peter was also dependent on people giving him. But Paul, due to certain special circumstances, decided that I don't want to be dependent. I want to be independent of people, mainly so that I can preach the truth uh, and so his trade was making tents. And so he made tents and earned his living and supported himself wherever he was going. Occasionally when he needed some more, some churches gave him some gifts. But he basically, I think 90% of his support was from his own making tents. So that's become an expression in Christendom for people who do any type of job I mean, you could be a, a teacher, or a nurse, or an engineer, or whatever it is, earning your own living and leading a church, or traveling and preaching the gospel. So we have felt in India that because of the tremendous scandal connected with money in Christian work, particularly in third world countries where people send reports to get money, and, uh, you know, India is 98% non-Christian. And a lot of those non-Christians despise Christians because the way Christians are begging for money, they think that Christians do Christian work only because they want to send reports to Western countries to get money. So we felt that we want to change that image in India and show non-Christians that we're not doing this for sending reports. We won't send any reports. We won't get any money from anybody. We'll do our own work and support ourselves and serve God and uh, take care of our needs and build a church and preach the gospel. So that's why in all our 50 churches that we planted, everyone is a tent maker. Tent maker means they earn their own living. Every single one elder, I, I work with about 70, 80 elders who lead these churches and every single one of them is a tent maker. It's a we're a unique denomination that way. Nobody's paid a salary. 
everybody's working in some form or the other. And um, in the same way, I've, I support myself also. And uh, I have never taken one cent from my local church for 37 years. We've um, provided for ourselves as a family. Okay. <clears throat> You once mentioned that we should listen to God more than speak in prayer. What does that look like? Is it simply being silent and thinking about him? Well, <clears throat> I have tried to read the Bible, uh, cutting off pre-programmed thinking that I've got from Christian books. Because I find that a lot of things that I've been indoctrinated with from my early Christian life may not be scriptural. So I read so many books on biographies on prayer and books on prayer and um, I said, Lord, I want to forget all that when I come to scripture and just try to get understand from scripture. And as I've understood scripture, prayer is like using a telephone. You know, calling up God on the telephone, just like you call up anybody. Call up, call up someone, dial a number, and speak to the person you want to speak to. Prayer is, I dial up God in Jesus' name, and the line is always open, unless there's sin in my life, in which case he doesn't pick up the phone. Uh, but, when you think of a telephone, it's got a mouthpiece and a earpiece. And don't you think if you're speaking to someone for one hour and you spend 59 and a half minutes speaking and give that other person 30 seconds to speak, it'd be pretty rude, right? Particularly if the other, type, other person is 10 times more spiritual than you. You wouldn't dream of doing that. Think if you're a young brother speaking to a very mature man of God and you spend one hour on the phone how much time would you spend listening and how much time would you spend talking I think I'd spend about one minute talking and 59 minutes listening if I were speaking to a much more godly person think if you're speaking to Almighty God himself do you think you should speak more or listen more I've sometimes people ask people to answer me this question. I say, supposing you hear me speaking on a phone right now, and uh, you watch me and hear me for a half an hour on that phone, and can you tell me at the end of the conversation, was I speaking to somebody more mature than me or less mature than me? Be easy, right? If you heard me doing most of the talking, then you know that I was speaking to someone who was maybe a young brother less mature than me. But if you, during that half an hour, you heard me hardly speaking anything but listening most of the time, you say, Brother Zach, you must have been speaking to somebody who's more mature than you, right? Okay, now apply that to God in prayer. You go to God in prayer and you spend half an hour in prayer and you spend almost all that time telling God this is what you need. It's like a shopping list. I want this, I want that, I want the other thing, this, 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 this. Amen. <laughs> well, that's like speaking to someone far more mature than you for half an hour and telling him all the things you think he should hear and then put the phone down. So I say, I don't want to talk, like, talk to God like that. I think, first of all, God doesn't need my shopping list. He already knows what my shopping list is before I tell him. Don't you think so? Jesus said that your heavenly father knows what you need before you ask him. He wants us to express our need, that's okay. But there's nothing I can tell him that he doesn't know. Nothing. There's nothing in the news that I can tell him. Lord, you know there's a famine here. Well, he already knew it. Or I, I can express a need and neither can I get God to have more compassion for this sick person than I have. He already is, loves that person more than me. I need to tell God about it, but remember that God knows about it. 
Remember that God's got more compassion for that person than I have. So I say, Lord, then what is the logic of prayer? Uh, I don't want to pray like a parrot. I don't want to pray, you know, blindly following a ritual like so many people. Um, I want my prayer to be meaningful. I believe God's asking me, like I told you, he gives us the opportunity to cooperate with him. And when I see that I've prayed for something, to me it's like giving the five loaves to Jesus. And I see the answer to that prayer. I say, hey, I'm glad I prayed. I believe God answers prayer. So I believe prayer is important. But I say that listening is also important because in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42, you read about two women, Mary and Martha. And Mary just sat listening to Jesus. And Martha was busy working, working, working in the kitchen. And when she came and complained to the Lord, saying, Lord, you're not again, uh, this sister is not helping me. Jesus said a very important thing, which, let me tell you this. God has spoken that word to me for 50 years. You know what that word is? Luke 10, 42. One thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part. And what did she do? She was sitting and listening. And particularly in the type of work I do, which is traveling, ministering the gospel, going here and there, mostly in India. In the early days, it was only in India. I say, Lord, I don't know where the greatest need is. I don't want to go somewhere and say, Lord, you come and bless my work. I want you to tell me where you want me to go. And I'll do what you tell me to do. So I see for myself the most important thing is to listen. So listening is not something I kneel down and try to, you know, very often if you try to keep quiet like that, your mind begins to wander to all types of things that you don't want to think about. Uh, so I'm not thinking of that type of listening. I, for me, listening is like getting into a habit of listening all the time. To be, uh, and the best illustration I can use is uh, a police officer who's got his, you know, radio or walkie talkie or whatever you call it on in his police cruiser, which is always on, connected to headquarters. And a message may come across that any time. Okay, go across to that street or there's an emergency there. And it's always on. But all the time, something's not coming through it, but he's listening, listening all the time. And doing his other work. All his other work while this is always on, with the antenna up. So that's the picture I have in my mind. I want to always be ready to listen. Whatever God's saying to me in different situations. It could be very ordinary things. You know, if there's an accident or something happens, what's God trying to tell me through that? When you're sick. And lie down in bed and, Lord, what are you trying to tell me now? Uh, I'll tell you a couple of things that God told me. I, I rode a scooter, two-wheel scooter in India for 46 years. And uh, by the grace of God, I never hurt anybody or hurt any. Um, there were a lot of angels who took care of that. But I did have one or two tosses myself. Not one or two, maybe three or four. But... <laughs> And when I got tossed, I mean, the early days I was learning, that's okay. But after some time when I got tossed, I said, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? He said, you shouldn't drive so fast. It could be something as simple as that. So listening is not some great spiritual truth. It may be something very practical. Another time, I was lying in hospital for something very minor for about seven days. And I said, Lord, why did you bring me to the hospital? You could have healed me without this. And um, I felt the Lord said to me that, yeah, I could have healed you without it, but you've been running around so much that I don't get a chance to talk to you. So you better lie down here for a few days and I, I'll talk to you. And that was very blessed to me. Those are some of the best days of my life, lying in bed seven days and listening to God and writing down what you told me. So it's become a habit now. And so when I 
when I get lots of invitations to go here, there, and everywhere, and I say, Lord, I don't know where I'm supposed to go. I want you to speak to me as to where I should go. And one of the remarkable things I've seen in the last 35, particularly in the last 30 years that we've been traveling outside Bangalore, and we've seen all these churches come up. And I say, Lord, this is, this is a miracle. Because if I had gone where I wanted to go, I'd probably waste my time. But when you tell me to go somewhere, it's like going to a tree where the apples are ready to fall. And I just pick it up. And so it's a more efficient way of doing God's work to go. And then you find that God's taken you to a place where people are just ready to hear. And uh, then once you finish that work, God, you say, Lord, where do you want me to go next? And then he leads you somewhere else. So it's a wonderful thing to, and that's how we've seen all these 30, 40 churches planted in a fairly short time. And I don't mean just churches. I mean, you know, it's very easy to go and get converted people. I'm talking about people who want to be disciples. And that's, so there are many advantages in listening. And you got to, then you, the next question comes as to, how do you know what is God's voice in the midst of all the other voices that you hear in your heart? Well, this is the illustration I use. I say, if you were to, if your mother were on the other side of this wall and you couldn't see her, and there are about 20 women talking there, you'd be able to pick out your mother's voice. But I can't. Why is that? Because you've heard your mother's voice so often. You recognize that voice <laughs> easily. I remember the other day, uh, just, I think it was yesterday, I, somebody sent me an email saying, uh, can you please call me up? Somebody I never knew, I've never met. He said, I've been listening to your message over the internet. So, I called him up and I said, can I speak to so-and-so? He said, hello, Brother Zach. I can recognize your voice anywhere. <laughs> I've heard it for so many years. <laughs> it's the first time I'm talking to him. And that really spoke to me, you know, that if you get accustomed to hearing somebody's voice like that, you, 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 I mean, you just person on the phone and you don't even know who it is, he immediately recognized the voice. So I say, if we get familiar, the way to get familiar with hearing God's voice is reading the Bible. Here's one book where you can be absolutely sure it's God's voice. And that is how I became familiar with his voice. To, I, I spent years and years studying this book. Particularly the early years of my Christian life. The first five years after I got baptized. I would ne All my spare time was spent studying the Bible. I became so familiar with hearing what God is saying. And that's why I say people who don't read the Bible and don't study it in depth and cry out to God as they read it and seek to obey him, you'll never be able to hear God's voice. So that is the way to hear. And then in different situations, you'll find God gives you an answer. I could give you numerous examples of that from my own life. Okay, could you share some practical nuggets on how to press on to a Christ-centered marriage and Christ-centered family? Well, <clears throat> one of the things I read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, sorry, chapter 3, concerning the qualifications of elders, was that if a man cannot bring up his own children properly, uh, cannot manage his own family, 1 Timothy 3, 5, how can he take care of the church of God? That means if you've got four children and you can't bring them up in godly ways, how in the world are you going to be an elder for a hundred people and bring them up in a godly way? That would be impossible. So I read that as a young person and I said, Lord, if my family life is not right, I can never build a church. I'm wasting my time trying to do God's work. But I saw around me the sad examples of numerous pastors and Christian workers whose children were wayward and they were going around preaching as if there was no connection between your family life and 
your church ministry. I believe there's a very close connection because we must live what we preach. And if we have not lived it, we shouldn't preach it. If something has not worked in my home, what right have I got to give that to other people? I mean, if you have a, if you have a DVD player that doesn't work at home, would you give that as a gift to somebody? Wrap it up in a nice paper and give it to somebody? You'd never do it. You'd never give a gift to somebody that doesn't work in your own home. Now my question is, do you give a gospel to somebody that doesn't work in your own home? A lot of people are doing it. They're giving a gospel to people which hasn't worked in their own home. What are you doing with that? It's like giving a DVD player, that, telling him, hey, listen, this doesn't work for me, but if you like, you can have it. So it must work in my own home first. I mean, if I go to, a, say, a non-Christian in India and say, do you know that Christ can forgive all your sins? And he says, really? And that's great. He says, I'd like to have that. But he's supposing that non-Christian tells me, but I have another problem. I keep fighting with my wife regularly at home. Can your Christ help me there? And you say, well, I don't know about that because I still do that in my home. So, but he'll forgive you. He'll say, I don't want this Christ of yours. And he's got every right to say that. If your Christ is so powerless. So that's just an example I'm using. So I was very convinced that I should not preach a gospel that has not worked in my own home first. So once you recognize the importance of that and you cry out to God for help, um, I believe God will help you. This is so important. I'll show you another passage in scripture which um, shows the importance of this. Let me ask, you're all great Bible scholars sitting here, let me ask you a question. Which scripture says you must be filled with the Spirit? You know where it is? Nobody knows the verse? Be filled, be not drunk with wine, but be filled. Is there a verse like that? Where is it? Ephesians 5.18. Okay. Well, you learned one verse today. Ephesians 5.18. <laughs> okay. Now, do you know there's a passage in scripture that speaks about wrestling with evil principalities and powers and putting on the whole armor of God, the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit, fighting against the devil? Do you know where that is? <laughs> Ephesians 6. Correct. Verses 10 to 18. Okay, now we've got two verses. What's the first verse? Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And what's the other reference? Ephesians 6, 10 to 18, fight against the devil. Two important passages of scripture, which are, by the way, not mentioned anywhere else in the whole New Testament. Be filled with the Spirit, fight against evil uh, satanic forces. Now tell me, what comes between these two passages? Home life. Husband, wife, parents, children, servants, and masters. Why is that sandwiched between being filled with the Spirit and fighting with the devil? I'll tell you why. <laughs> because to live a good home life, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And secondly, the one area where the devil's going to attack the most, where you need the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit and everything else, is in your home. It's very significant that home life is mentioned in between these two very important passages. So it's, I'm mean, just trying to emphasize that. And I believe the greatest truth in scripture to have a happy home life is what Jesus said, take up the cross every day and follow me. And I use an illustration sometimes. It's an illustration. Supposing you live next door to a neighbor who's always fighting with his wife, husband, wife. Every morning, 6.30, you hear them yelling at each other like an alarm clock starts off every morning, yelling, screaming, 
and you know in India the houses are so close to each other you can hear what goes on in the next house so every day you hear this fighting and it's gone on for years and one day you wake up at 630 and it's perfect peace what happened you go there and you discover that one of them is dead either the husband or the wife doesn't matter <laughs> and he said, ah, that's why there was peace. That's the secret of peace in the home as well. One person must be willing to die to himself every day. That's the meaning of taking up the cross. And if both are willing to die, boy, that'll be heaven. <laughs> so I use this example as well. See, if this two hands is a picture of husband and wife clashing, you know that if one hand refuses to cooperate, there'll be no sound. Whichever hand it is, let the other person get agitated. One person says, no, I'm going to die. <laughs> there is peace. If both are willing to die, there's fellowship. That's the best. So if you can't have fellowship, at least have peace. <laughs> so that is the secret and of husband-wife relationships. And bringing up children is that simple verse in the Old Testament, Proverbs 22. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. And Children need to be disciplined. The Bible says even God disciplines his children and you can't be a better father than God. Now I know that there are in many countries laws against physical um, spanking of children, etc. But discipline doesn't always have to be physical like that. Um, the Bible speaks about discipline. It could be withholding privileges. It could be many different forms. But a child must know that he's got to obey his parents when he's small. There are two things particularly we need to teach children. One is to obey parents, to respect parents. And the other is to speak the truth. To me, those are the two most important things. You must not tolerate your child telling a lie. From early in life, you have to teach that child to speak the truth. Even if they did, a, if they did something terribly wrong, say, come and tell me the truth. It doesn't matter. I'll forgive you, but don't try and deceive me. And the other is teach them to honor and respect father and mother. Those are some of the simple things. And the greatest verse for child bringing up children in the Bible, as I see it, is James 1, verse 5. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Say, Lord, I don't know how to bring up children. Give me wisdom in this particular situation, how to handle this difficult situation with this child. And it's a different way when they are five years old, and it's a different way when they are 18 years old. And at each stage you need wisdom from God. And it says if you ask God for wisdom, he'll give it to you. Okay, how do we know we have really forgiven someone from our heart? Sometimes I think I've forgiven, but when I remember the things they've done, I become upset and angry again. It's a back and forth scenario. I would say, yeah, five minute break, sure.